Good afternoon, Oakstone. Good afternoon to everyone on the stream, whoever's on there. We never know. I mean, if you're looking at the computer, you might know, but I have no idea who's on the stream today, so welcome, everybody. Hi, I think my, my parents are on there. Welcome to mom and dad. Welcome to John and Tony Coffee. Uh, we miss seeing you all here. And hope everyone, whoever else is streaming, is having a wonderful and restful Sabbath. Uh, and that we just, we just pray that this time will be one that is an, uh, enlightening um, and we'll just lift you up spiritually. So let's go ahead and get started. And I need to pull my notes up. That's how I'm going to get started. And we're going to get started in the book of Matthew, chapter 13. Matthew, chapter 13, verses 44, starting there. These are parables that Jesus is telling. He's in the middle of several of these parables about what the kingdom of heaven is like. And it's kind of easy to read over these and take them at a surface value. At least I do that oftentimes to look at these and say, hey, look, this is what the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is about. Um, but I want to go a little deeper into this one and then kind of get into the implications of what this, these, these actually two parables are about. But these are related parables. They're right next to each other. Let's start off in verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Verse 45 through 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and he bought it. So that's, that's the parable. But I've, I always kind of read that and thought, that's nice. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. And we move on to the next one. I want to dig into this a little bit today. The first point I want to make on this is that there are two different ways that people can come to know about the kingdom of heaven, right? This, this shows us two, two such. The first guy is out there actively not looking for it. He is probably plowing a field and his plowshare or plow, um, whatever they're called, the, the blade probably hits a box and the horse stops dead in his tracks and there's a, there's a, what is this? And so there's some digging, there's some effort involved to get it out. The second man is actively looking and pursuing this sort of rich, riches. He's looking for it. He's seeking it out. And these are the main ways that we really come to find out about it, right? Either we're not looking for it and someone tells us about it. We're not looking for it. We come across a piece of literature that leads us to God. We're not looking for it. Maybe God in his word, a word or a phrase that you've, that's always been there, but you haven't really noticed before. It connects with you and it connects in your heart. And you say, that's something new I haven't seen before, but I wasn't looking for it. It's just the word and or a person, or whatever it is, reaches out and grabs you. And then there's those times that we're actually looking for something, and we, uh, we find it in the Word, or we're looking for these riches that God offers us, not physical riches, mind you, but these riches of, of His kingdom, and we're pursuing truth and what that looks like, and we find it. So I want to underscore there are two ways one can come to learn about this, this kingdom of heaven. And both of these stories that Jesus was telling, there's another point that comes up, and it's that both of these men immediately recognized the intrinsic value of this thing that they had found, right? People love treasure and treasure stories. That's why we have movies like National Treasure. That's why we have uh, the, the book Treasure Island. There's this romance and intrigue associated with treasures, particularly if it's hidden treasure or pirate treasure or whatever. Why is that? I don't know. I think it's probably because there's obvious <laughs> inherent worth in the treasure. If I find this box of treasure, I can retire and I can go on about doing whatever I want, else want now because uh, there is no more need to work. Uh, but there's also, I think there's an inherent curiosity about who put it there. Why is this here? How did it get there? What's, what's the deal with this treasure? Why is it in the middle of a field? Why is it this massive pile, uh, pearl of great price in a market? There is a love of treasure in some sense. Some people actually like make careers out of hunting for treasure. So I don't want it to be too difficult for us to imagine this. I don't think it should be too difficult for us to imagine this, what it's like uh, the kingdom of heaven being as a great treasure. So work with me on this is, is uh, throughout this, that imagining that you found a treasure in a field or you found something in a market that you understand the value of and that maybe nobody else there does. 
Maybe the guy selling it does, but you immediately go to liquidate your things. And what was cool about this is when they saw it, they moved immediately because the value, the value was established in their minds. It was, there was no question about it. They didn't need to send it out for analysis. They didn't need to call in the experts to look at the treasure, to look at the pearls, to ins inspect for the value or the worth of the carat of the diamonds or the gold or whatever the treasure in the box was. And nor did they need to come to find out if this was actual pearl or imitation pearl. They knew what they were looking for, and when they found it, they moved on it. And I think that's an important thing. that When we see God's truth, when we see the matter of his kingdom, don't wait. There's, a, there's an urgency to move on it because someone else, at least in this analogy, someone else could have moved it in and taken it out from underneath of you. So there's this enthusiasm in moving on it. Imagine if you found something so good like that in the market, you're, you're, or you're on eBay and you see something come up. I've seen this before where something comes up for auction. I'm like, that can't possibly be. I know what that's worth, and I see that, and you, you just cannot wait to get it. If you didn't have the funds for it immediately available, you'd go and make some assets liquid so that you could get it because you understand that. But imagine that it's something that's so, so good that you literally were willing to liquidate everything, your home, your vehicle, <clears throat> your lifestyle, your job, everything you've known up to that point and placed your worth in, you're willing to liquidate it for this, whatever this particular treasure is that you found on eBay, at an auction, at an art yard, at a bad art party. Don't, seriously, don't sell your house to buy bad art. That's where we want to raise a few dollars for charity, but don't do that. But when you find this thing, it's so unquestionably valuable. And yet, I have a question for you. Who's coming out ahead in this scenario? You have about, you've literally just bought, sold everything you have to buy this thing. It's not the seller that's coming out ahead. It's you. you. You understand the worth of this thing. You have gotten rid of everything that is near and dear to you in order to acquire this one thing, and yet you are still the one who's coming out ahead. And that's sort of the way that God works in paradoxes, right, to where you have to let everything go in order to inherit the thing that is of worth. So let's be keeping that in mind as we go through this, right? The reason why they moved so quickly on this is because he, the two men that found these things, they had everything to gain, everything to gain. And so they moved on it. And then not only did they just sell everything, but I wanted to point out that they said, Read this, let's read this again. It says in uh, the latter half of verse 44, it says, and for the joy over it, he goes and sells all he has and buys the field. They don't only get rid of all the things that they held dear previous to that point. They are joyfully doing so. This is the worth and the esteem with which they hold the thing that they found. They are happy to let go of all the lesser things, the things that up to that point were worth so much to them. It's their life savings, their life investments, everything they put in. It's the home they created. It's the fields that they tended. It's the vineyards they maybe put up. Every last thing that they were willing to invest their time in prior to that point was counted as rubbish so that it acquired this thing of greater price. Let's turn to Psalm 119 and verse 162. 119 uh, verse 62. says, <laughs> did I get that right? Oh, 162, I'm sorry, not 62, 162. It's a very large psalm. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. So we begin to see what this treasure is starting to represent. It represents a couple different things. God's word is one of them. And that the psalmist is able to see God's word in writing, what he has of it in writing, what he receives from the Lord, all these different things that he values it in the same vein as he would treasure. This is a man, the psalmist, I assume this is the psalm, yeah, this is the psalm of David, uh, 119, I believe. This is a man who wasn't wanting for anything in terms of treasure. He was vastly wealthy in terms of resources and assets. He wasn't wanting for anything. And yet, what is it? It's God's word that he rejoices in and finds great treasure in it. 
Let's come up to Matthew 6, verse 21 now. Matthew 6, 21. We all know this verse, but it says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The reason and the way these men were able to rejoice over what they found is because their heart was completely in the right place. What they wanted was something more than the physical, more than the physical realm of homes, vineyards, farms, cattle, gold. Their heart was set on what the treasure was. The treasure is God's word. The treasure is the kingdom of heaven. And I just want us to recognize that, that, to see that they're able to be joyful because they have such a desire for this thing. And I can speak for myself to say that that desire so often isn't, isn't at the forefront. It's, it's the thing that I need to get next for, to make this happen. It's the thing that I need to get next, uh, this next tool I need to get to make something happen on, on our, little, our property. Or this next thing that I get so excited about getting in the mail that that's going to enable me to uh, improve my life in some way, shape, or form. Th- that's the stuff that all too often seems to get me excited. Um, but when we realize what this proverb is saying, not this proverb, this, this um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank, the story that Jesus is telling, the parable, thank you, the parable, um, this is where he wants our hearts to be. Our focus is supposed to be here. Fourth, the meta here, metaphor here is obviously that the treasure, the, the, either the buried chest of treasure or the pearl of great price, it's the kingdom of heaven. This is fairly obvious. But this is what he wants us to be focusing on. And I think this is actually, it's actually a foreshadowing. Let's be turning over to Revelation 21. Revelation 21 and verse 10. I find this interesting that he compares it to treasure, a great pearl. We can come over to Revelation 21 in verse 10. We'll do a little reading to get through this. And he carried me away in the spirit. This is John um, talking about the vision um, or that, that he was having. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, a holy, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was a most, like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And if you fast forward now to verse um, 18, the construction of its wall was jasper and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. And the foundation of the walls of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth Christ of praise, the 11th jacinth, and the 12th amethyst. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. I think the, the, the treasure that Jesus is alluding to, he doesn't say what's in the treasure box, but we know what's in treasure boxes. It's usually gold, it's usually silver, it's usually jewels and gems. Could be pearls too. And then the, the pearl of great price, this, this pearl, we see these things as the kingdom of heaven descends on earth in the form of Jerusalem, right? So it's this really cool foreshadowing that he has in there. And continuing in verse 22, but I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it, and the Lamb is its light. Isn't this a treasure that we can look forward to? This is what we have in our future if we stay the course, if we submit fully to Jesus, if we submit fully to following him. This is the treasure that was alluded to. And the analogy is apt because this is the kingdom of heaven that comes down from heaven. And it is a literal, the whole thing is the treasure, right? The whole thing is the treasure. So is 
be having God with us and the lamb being there forever, right? That is the treasure above all treasures. You can take away the gold and the gems if you wanted to. That's the main treasure. And it doesn't say this directly. It sort of does, but it, not, not in so many words. But it, those who value the treasure and give up these things of the world in order to pursue it, they will be there too. They have been transformed into spirit. They're no longer fallen flesh. And note that a city of this massive size, it doesn't really say what's in it besides kind of the construction. But wouldn't it be those who are Christ that is coming, those who are Christ's and have accepted them in the past. They're spirit beings now. And verse 27 actually does allude to this a little bit more. It says, those who enter are found in the Lamb's book of life. And look here in Revelation uh, 21 verse 9, it says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bills filled, uh, bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked to me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. He was talking about the city coming down. The bride, the lamb's wife, that's, those are the people who believe in Jesus and who are his at his coming, who are always his, those who have died in Christ and who will be resurrected into him. That's the bride of Christ. This city is referred to the bride of Christ, so I'm assuming that it contains the people who are the bride of Christ. So in a weird twist, we actually become part of the treasure. The treasure is for us, and yet we also become a part of it. The treasure is a glorified and perfected version of ourselves, united for eternity with Jesus and with the Father, to work with them, to dwell with them, to live with them, to love on them, to have all the things, all the things that we're here for, preparing ourselves for, that's it. So I want to take this time now, I've been trying to paint this picture of why this treasure is so valuable, why we not be something we pass up or walk over or, or hyperanalyze, but just we just go for it and then we pursue it. I want to ask us all to take a minute to introspect on, the, on these questions, and I'll do it with us, but I have a few questions I want to ask. Let's take a couple of moments to, to silently think about it. How are you responding to this offer of the kingdom of heaven? If you've considered yourself in these parables, how are you can, responding to the offer that's being given to us? Do we see the true value of this treasure? What are you willing to part with to seek the kingdom of heaven? And are we joyous about that? Are we joyous about letting it go because we see the reward that's be forthcoming for it? And are you willing to forsake everything that you know or you think you know for this treasure? Forsaking all these things in order to acquire this is similar to another thing, another directive we see throughout the Bible. And that's why I spend the rest of our time focusing on today. And further, if we do this one thing, it's very simple. It's literally two words. If we do this one thing that is incredibly simple and yet extraordinarily complex in its execution, it doesn't have to be complex. I'm just saying it's hard then the kingdom of heaven will be ours. The treasure will be ours. And it all depends on our level of submission, and it all depends on our level of foresight. And the admonition is this. Jesus told us again and again and again, as he was gathering his followers, as he was going through the, his, his um, walk and his preparation his ministry, the admonition is this. And he said this, follow me. You have to do nothing else except follow Jesus. He is the way and the truth and the life. The way, meaning not just a way of doing things, literally a way like a road. The, the Romans would call their roads the way. The Appian Way is still a road that stands today. It's, you occasionally see streets in, the, in this, these cities still called something way. He's the road of truth to life. So if we follow him on this road... We'll, we'll end up with the treasure. In the Old Testament, I don't know, this is not official. This is, this is Justin's uh, summarization of, of themes. In the Old Testament, you could say 
that the, if you could summarize it in two, word, or two or three words, it would be, turn to me. And I would say in the New Testament, you could summarize it as, follow me. Now, these are sort of the same things, but I wanted to say that just to say that God has always been asking men to follow him, to turn to him, to follow him. It's, this is nothing new, but will we do it, and how will we do it? I want to look at how Jesus has used this, right? And, and kind of look at some of the real life instances as he was calling his disciples and his apostles. And he was choosing his own. Let's go to Matthew 4 and verse 18 because I want to, I want to talk about the real life. Some of you all may have seen The Chosen. And if you have, it does a really good job of taking what could be an, a text and giving it huge context and backstory. Now, I, well, I'm, full disclosure, I, I invested some in The Chosen, so I will always push The Chosen, but yeah, it really is a good show, even if I hadn't invested, invested in it, but <clears throat> it doesn't cost anything to watch, so. But it does such a fantastic job of taking people and showing them what they were doing, where they were when they encountered Jesus, and then what they gave up, right? So let's go to Matthew 4 and verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers... Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And look what they did. Did they talk about it? Did they analyze it? Did they say, I got taxes due next week or whatever? They said no. They immediately, in verse 20, they immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat was Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them, and immediately they left the boat, their father, and followed him. So can we just stop to appreciate this for a second? These guys were, I think they just seen Jesus for the first time. We can't really know that. He, he may have been about town, and they may have heard some things. But they just saw him, and they recognized something in him. And they recognized something of worth, something of value, and they didn't stop to think about it that I can tell. They didn't stop to analyze it. They didn't stop to do that. God gives us the ability to analyze things. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing. But they saw what was good and immediately left and followed him. I think the way this works is when you see something that is so good and you have something by comparison to it, it makes it easy to walk away from these other things, right? It's all on a scale of relativity. So for us to be able to successfully be able to walk away from these things, we have to, by comparison, to be able to see God up here in our priority list. Whereas if we're not looking at him, something else is going to take its place. How many of us believe we could actually do something like that? If we, if we could just walk away from the life that we know. Now we know that Peter maintained a wife and he was able to still, you know, uh, uh, have a wife and, and all that. Um, and in Acts, actually, after Jesus left, he actually went back to fishing for a time. So there was there were these things that they had some aspect of it, but when they're told to come and follow Jesus, they immediately dropped everything and left. And I find that just to be a fantastic and amazing example that they're able to do something like that. And look, Jesus doesn't call us to a purposeless, purposeless life. Maybe, maybe we don't all know where our ministry is or what it is that Jesus is calling us to do right now. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But what we do know is that when Jesus calls someone to do something, he invites us alongside of him to experience the bliss and I guess the glory of the ministry that he will be taking to people, right? Look at the very next verse, verse 23. And Jesus went all about Galilee. So they say, okay, we'll follow you. And what's next? They went all about Galilee teaching, well, Jesus was teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. His disciples got a first row seat to see these miracles, these amazing things happening. If they hadn't decided to follow Jesus, they would have still been hauling nets on the fishing boat. They would have still been in the drudgery of a life without a meaningful calling or purpose. And maybe we all... We've all found ourselves in that position at one point or, point or another in our lives. Maybe you find yourself there now. But the good news is that Jesus is calling each and every one of us to work alongside him in some way, shape, or form. 
we recall that when this gets brought up here often, that there are many parts to a body, a working body of the church. And each part does its share in its part. The ring toe or the index toe is a pretty unenviable job until you take it away and you realize the body can't walk very well without those things. You, you, I, I once had a, um, I thought I had broken my pinky toe of all things. I hadn't. It just had a weird cramp in it for like two days. But I couldn't hardly walk. I was hobbling around. I, I, I looked like I'd been completely thrashed. Um, you take away one little part like that, and though it's not the head and though it's not the heart, the things that get maybe the most attention, the body suffers. And so God assembles a body and puts them together because there are ministries that need to be accomplished within and without the congregation. And he asks us to go and do it. And the good news is when we're following him and we're in a position to make ourselves available for when he tells us to pick up and go and do something, then I feel like that's oftentimes the times he can use us. Now, Jesus isn't asking us to desert our families. Um, we, we know that, like I said, Peter maintained a wife. But let's go to Matthew, Matthew 10, 37 through 38. He gives a little more detail on this. Um, he says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. What's, what's the priority? Are we looking up here? Or are we looking right here? If this is the son and daughter or wife or family, and we're looking up to it, but when we put something higher than that, then everything falls in its right place, right? And he who does not take his cross, or say, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross, the difficulties, the, the, the burdens to bear, and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. That goes back to the people who, who found their treasure in the field. They were willing to completely lose the life that they knew for his sake so that they could find this amazing great treasure, the kingdom of heaven. I want to give another example here of, of a time that someone was willing to walk away and what that looks like when we have to do that. Matthew 8, verse uh, 19, <clears throat> starting in verse 19. Matthew 8, 19. When Jesus saw uh, great multitudes, I'm sorry, where did I? oh yeah, verse 19. Then a certain scribe came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. There can be a great cost when it comes to following Jesus. You get the adventure, yeah. It's, a big, it's an adventure sleeping in a field or sleeping without a tent or not having a home. It's a big adventure, uh, but it's not going to say it comes without its hardships. But you have that front row seat to see what Jesus is doing and changing hearts and minds and lives. Verse 21, then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Now, that seems a little cruel maybe if you, if you take it on its, on its face. Jesus is calling them essentially dead, those who weren't following him. And I, I suppose spiritually they would be, have been dead. But let their dead bury their own dead. That seems a little cruel to let a guy put his dad in the ground. But I think the lesson we can take from this is we don't get to qualify or quantify what it looks like in service to Jesus. When he wants us to come and do something and follow him, he gets to set the terms of that service for us, right? He sets the T's and the C's, the terms and conditions, and he, we get to follow those, right? It's always on Jesus' terms if we're going to follow him the way he wants us to follow him. Let's go to Luke, uh, Luke 5 and verse 27. This is when uh, Matthew uh, is called Luke 5, verse 27 also known as Levi, uh, this part. So after these things, 527, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And I like how he did this. And I actually like how the chosen portrays this as well. So he left all, rose up, and followed him. He has this realization that there is something better than all the riches sitting in front of him that have been given to him in which he is typically, probably, been wrongfully using. That was very common to the tax collectors of their day. They were scorned and hated 
by the Jews of the time because they would constantly misappropriate funds and use it to enrich their own lives. He got up. He walked away. He was willing to walk away from wealth. wealth, And when he did so, he found purpose. He immediately found purpose. He was on the front row of life-changing ministry for people. We see this today, too. There are modern examples of this. This is not limited to the Bible. We see, um, I, if you've talked to me in the last few weeks, I've talked, uh, mentioned this movie called, uh, this documentary film called Free Burma Rangers, and the, the main guy in that's name is David Eubank, and um, he was kind of going about his business, and in the United States, he was an ex, uh, he had retired from the military, and he was going about his business, trying to serve the Lord, whatever that looked like. His dad called him and said, there's a need for you uh, here in uh, Burma. Would you be willing to come? And he said, let me pray about it. And while he was on the phone with his dad, praying about it, he said, yes, I will go. And within days, he proposed to the girl he was dating and said, I'm going. You can come with me if you want or not, but I'm going. And um, he was on his way there, and he began to run into harm's way with, I think it was about 100 bucks in his pocket and five medical kits. And he started running towards the sound of gunfire to help people. There are people who hear a good calling and understand what God wants them to do, and they go toward it, and they run toward it. There are people like, I'm going to embarrass him a little bit if, he's, if he ever watches this, but Brian Foy, you know, a lot of you know, may know Brian Foy, who, uh, who, who guest speaks here sometimes. He, um, he and his family have recently, he felt the Lord moving him to retire, and he, in the very much prime of his life, uh, quit his job and has dedicated his life and that life of his family to completely serving God in whatever way he leads. They're about to go down to a very, very distant rural part of Mexico, I, get, I believe in beginning in March of this year, for like a nine-month stint to spread the gospel, taking the whole family, packing up and going for the love of the gospel and serving the Lord. There's uh, some folks that pass through OCC here uh, Spencer, your friends, I can't remember their name, but they came through here a couple weeks ago. They had mentioned um, that they were um, just traveling. And well, you want to know why are you, why are you just traveling? What, what, what could lead a person to just travel? And um, they, they said that they had felt the Lord say, you're putting too much emphasis on your home. You need to sell your home. Just go. And that's what they did. How much faith does it take to just slap your home on the market and not know where you're going, not really know what you're doing, but to just go. We've had other people come through here who have done very similar things. I don't think that's the thing that everyone has to do. God's not calling every single person to do that. But he does give us unique callings. There are others in the Bible too. There are multitudes that were following Jesus. We see the 5,000 that he's preaching to. There's the 3,000. It says the multitudes were constantly pressing in. They see something in this man. They recognize the value and the treasure of what he is offering, what he's teaching. He taught is a man with authority. He's bringing this good news of the kingdom. They see this treasure and they want to pursue it, right? And even the, uh, the uh, demoniac, the one who was possessed by a legion in, in the Gadarene, the region of the Gadarenes, he, when he had had the um, demon cast out, he obviously it was on a very front row uh, experience of a miracle there. I uh, was very personally affected by it. But he was begging Jesus to allow him to follow him. I just want to follow you. I want to be with you, near you. I want to understand more about you. I want to serve you. And I think that's a beautiful attitude. This is coming from a man who had been severely aligned with darkness for, if not his whole life, the better part of his life. And the moment it's removed, he sees in like a new childlike way of looking at the world, I want to follow you, Jesus, because you are the way, the truth, and the life, and you are the way to this treasure. I want to examine John 21, real quick, please. John 21 and verse 22. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 20. <clears throat> Then Peter turned around and saw the disciple whom Jesus uh, loved following, who had also leaned on his breast at the supper and had said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? 
And Jesus said to him, I think they're talking about who, who would be the, the greatest or um, who would, uh, what they're supposed to do. It was their assignments, actually. Peter said, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if I will that he remains till I come, what, what is that to you? You follow me. So what does this tell us about following Jesus? I think it tells us to stop worrying so much about what the other person's doing. And you worry about what God is calling you to do. You have a role. Don't you worry about the other person's ministry so much. There's times and places where we need to call out bad doctrine or incorrect things. That's, I'm not saying that should never go unaddressed. But I would say like 99% of the time, that's not really necessary because we got enough to worry about in our own hearts and our own minds. When we focus on doing the will that God wants us to do, following Jesus that's, that's what he wants us to do. It's in another verse. It says, who are you to judge another man's servant? Right? Jesus says, what is that to you? You follow me. You follow me. I want to compare and contrast a couple of other men who are called to leave all and follow Jesus. Um, Mark 10, verse 17. There's a little bit, a little bit of a lengthy passage, but... It's good stuff. Mark 10 and verse 17. We'll jump. Uh, we'll go right through it. Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know all the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud on your father and mother. And he's, and he's setting them up. And he answered him, the man answered him and said to him, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. By the way, this man is, is the, the, what's called the rich young ruler in the headings. And Jesus looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come, take up the cross and follow me. Now, this is a different result than the ones that we looked at earlier. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for those who possess great riches to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard is it for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they are greatly astonished, probably somewhat perplexed, and saying among themselves, who, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with men is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. And then Peter began to say to him, see, we have left all and followed you. And so Jesus answered and said, surely I say to you, no, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are last, first will be last, and the last first. So there's a few points I wanted to take out of this that I thought were, were interesting. The first is this. One can really work at keeping the commandments, and then all be following Jesus. We've seen that example with the Pharisees. That sounds a little... A little controversial almost, I think, maybe. But you can look at the example of the Pharisees who were certainly keeping the commandments. Not only were they not following Jesus, they didn't recognize Jesus when he was manifested right in front of them in the flesh. So you can be keeping the commandments, but certainly not following Jesus, just as this man did. He, he physically chose to not follow Jesus while he had been in full compliance with the commandments, basically his whole life, at least according to his testimony. The call to follow Jesus also, we already talked about this a little bit, it would look different for each person. Uh, Jesus had this guy's number. He knew his heart and he gave him the thing that cut him basically to it, to the quick, to the quick of his heart straight away. He, he knew that this man had an issue with turning to riches or to looking into that. In the case of this guy, yeah, it was money and things, but maybe for us, it's something else. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more uh, in the, in the, briefly here. Jesus knows the things we love most, and he will not ask us to give it up if it's not healthy or good for us. He's not cruel. 
he, he would only ask us to give up something if it's not edifying for us or if it takes us away from him or if he has something that is just so much better. I also thought this was interesting. I don't know that I noticed this before. Jesus actually says this. He promises that those who follow him in this life for his sake and the gospel's sake will receive a hundredfold. In this life, I would have always kind of assumed, yeah, that's often in the, the coming kingdom of heaven. But he says in this life, you will receive a hundredfold. Now, did the disciples and apostles have a whole bunch of money to their names? I would venture to say no, not so much. So they will receive a hundredfold and yet have no money. So I'm left to interpolate that this means bigger, better blessings than fiscal ones, right? Blessings of being accompanying their creator, the savior who is doing amazing works, who, are, who is doing all these things. That's not just applicable to those in Jesus' time though. It still applies now. That those who leave these things and reach for something better for his sake and for the gospel's sake will receive a hundredfold in this life. But it also says they'll receive persecution. So we're trading relative comfort. We're trading the things that make us happy in a temporal sense in this world for persecution. Is it a fair trade? That's why we have to keep our eye on the treasure and not the things. And why Jesus was saying it's so difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom is because we do get attached to these things. Right? We get very, very attached to the comfort and the things that we know. And it means walking away from what we might have or love. But let's fast forward now and see another man. This is uh, Philippians 3. Philippians 3 and verse 3. This is Paul writing. He says, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, Rejoice in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has confidence in the flesh, I'm more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things I were gained to me I have counted these loss for Christ. Other translations say um, that kind of loss. Um, I, I, I may be thinking of a different verse, but there's one that says essentially he counts them as, as refuse, as dung, as waste. By comparison, that relative comparison, they're so low compared to what Jesus has and what he's offering us. They're so low. There's nothing that could compare to it. So Paul says, I count all things lost for the, um, I've counted loss for Christ. Yes, Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may, that's it, rubbish right there, is dung, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law. We don't get our righteousness from obeying the commandments. It comes through him. But that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death if by any means I may attain to resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already attained or that I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do... Forgetting these things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. To follow Jesus, you have to be willing to walk away from the old things, to reach ahead to the new things and follow him where he leads. When we leave behind these former things and we walk in new paths, uh, the simple truth of that, it means that change is required. It's change that we have to do. Um, this is a bit of an aside. We'll come right back to that. But this is a bit of an aside. And this is just Justin's opinion right here. So take this for what it's worth. I believe that the rich young ruler actually was Paul. If you look at the comparisons, he was a guy who kept all God's law since his youth. He had great wealth. Paul says he was able to um, know, uh, be, be content whether he knew um, uh, whether all things were abounding or whether there was uh, nothing, 
right? There is just, there's actually a laundry list of things that says this is probably Paul. And when Jesus told him that, cut to the heart, probably got angry and went around persecuted until Jesus came and saw him again. I don't know. There's, you can go look that up. There's other things that say that. I think that's a really fascinating take on that. Um, and it may explain a little bit of Paul's early history. But to this message, it's actually quite irrelevant. I just thought it was interesting. To follow Jesus, you have to be willing to walk away from the old and follow him to the new. So I want to ask you to consider for your life, each person here, for your life, what is it that's standing in the way? What's standing in the way? What is it you must be willing with to part with to follow Christ? Is it a home? Is it a house? Is it your spare time? Is it a hobby? Is it your money? Is it an addiction? Is it like, is it a drink or is it a thing that, to look at that you have to part from? Is it something that buys for your time more than, than the Lord's time that he gets or should get from us? Is it a pet doctrine? Is it a job? Is it, I don't know. You know what's in it. And if you don't know what it is in your life, then I would say be asking God to show you to reveal what it is, what it is in your life that needs to change so that if it's inhibiting you from following Jesus, that they can be removed, that you could have this walk where you're, you're blessed a hundredfold in this life. Again, not just, not fiscally, but the blessings that come from following Jesus, the, the joy, the ability to pursue the treasure, the, the seeing and the vision of what is yet to come for him, right? Um, Personal story I'll share with you. Uh, a few months ago, probably maybe six months ago, maybe a year ago, I can't remember, um, I was praying, and I, I'm still learning to understand God's voice. Um, I don't, sometimes I don't know if it's me or if it's him. And I was praying, and um, the thought occurred to me is, like, stop drinking alcohol. Just stop, like, altogether. I was like, oh, no, that's a bridge too far. No, 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 That must be me thinking that. Not God saying anything of that sort. That would be, that would be cruel and unusual, right? So, but it was, I, what did I do? I ignored it. I ignored it. Um, for me, at that time, that was too much to give up on something I was uncertain of. So you see when uncertainty comes in, and when it's something that you really like or don't really want to quit doing, you have a difficult, let's just say that was God telling me that. You have a very difficult time following if it's something you love and you don't love less in comparison to him or if there's an uncertainty. So that goes back to the men who found the treasure in the field. They were dead certain of what it was and they were glad to follow it too. So I fell down on that one. Now I have been going through completely, uh, Chuck and I and some others, we completely took January off and it's actually been a big blessing to be able to kind of refocus, um, drop, some, drop some weight and, um, you know, have some sobriety of mind um, of those things. So I think, I think that was, was the Lord asking me to do it. It probably wasn't for a forever time, but when he reveals that to you, I guess what I'm trying to say is don't cast it aside. Maybe ask him for confirmation but don't cast it aside just because you don't want to do it or you don't like it like I did. John 10, 27. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And what do I give them? I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Are you not quite sure how to follow Jesus? There's a lot of ways you could probably fill in the blanks on that. If you look at Jesus' ministry in the New Testament, Jesus spent a lot of his time doing these things. I don't think this is the exhaustive list. But if you want to follow Jesus, here's some things to start with. It's not just coming to church on Saturday. I'll give you a hint on that. It's an interceding on behalf of others, whether you like them or not, whether they're your enemy or your friend. It's helping to heal both physically, helping to heal relationships, Helping to be a peacemaker between people. Helping to bring people to something higher than what it is they currently worship. 
It's to teach repentance. It's to preach hope and to to preach truth, to speak words of life to people. It's to stand against the things that aren't of the Father. It's to pursue the Father's will. It's to, to care for the less fortunate. It's to give up self and service to others, even right down to your life. And you know what I find? I think it's easier to say, yeah, I give up my life for someone. That's easy in some ways when you're talking about just dying because that's one and done. What about giving up your life for someone every single day of your life in terms of service to one another, in terms of kindness, in terms of bringing a spirit of hope and love to one another? That's much harder, at least for me, I would think. Taking on burdens, emotional and physical, these are all aspects of, of, of the ministry of Jesus. And when we follow him in his ministry, we as the disciples of him, we go down those same paths. And that's, you can do that from where you are anywhere in your life right now. You don't have to be up here. You don't have to, you, don't, you can do it exactly where God has you right now. And when you follow those on those on those steps, he will probably open doors so much greater. Um, there's a, there's just so many examples of, of times when God has given a little, people have been faithful a little, and he opens up the doors to where they can be faithful and so much more. When we see the treasure of the kingdom of heaven, do we rise up to seize it? Are we willing to leave all to follow Jesus? And is it a joy for us to do it? And I think I want to ask, do we have faith enough to trust Jesus that he will lead us in good places? I think um, a lot of us tend to want to have to have control over our own lives and set our own destinies. But that, when you've been bought at a price and you're no longer your own, we don't really get to do that anymore. Not in a, in a, I guess you could even say in a legal sense, we are not allowed to do that anymore. We ought not be allowed to. We are allowed to choose to do it, but we are not in a legal sense in that we have been bought with blood, and that's the exchange that we've made by the blood of our Savior. John 12, 25. A couple more verses and we'll wrap up. John 12, 25. Jesus says, He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me... Oh, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. Um, yeah, just, just 25, I'm sorry. He, he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, continuing, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him, my father, will honor. So we're exchanging the things of this world and the things of this earth that can take us away from pursuing Jesus and following him, and we trade those in, we are given honor by the Father. It says in other parts that Jesus will, if we, those who overcome, Jesus will present before the Father and he'll be given a new name. That is a treasure in and of itself, not to mention all the other abundance of riches that God promises us for those who overcome. Jesus is the express image of God in human form, manifested in the flesh, the word which is manifest, and he came here to walk out and show us a life and give us an example that we could follow. He was not just here to give us an example. He was here to redeem us and to purchase us and to pay that cost, but he was also here to model that life. He showed us how. Let's follow him.